Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first of two lectures for this week on uh, Chapters 8 and the for at least the first part of Chapter 9 um, from our last three chapters for our last two weeks of our Advanced Exercise Physiology class here for the spring semester at Concordia. And we're talking about body composition and management. Um, it is currently, for me, about 5 o'clock in the evening. I've been trying for the last couple hours to record and try to keep my daughter at bay to wonder why I have disappeared from the living room, even though I've been there all day, waiting for my wife to uh, get done with all of her phone calls that went long, um, so I don't have to necessarily be recording videos at midnight and 1 a.m., and it doesn't usually work out the way I want it to. Like all things, you have to get it done within a period of time as opposed to an exact time of these days, right? You have an end time, you know you got to get it done by, but at the exact time of when it's going to happen within the time frame of when something has to be done is a whole different ballgame. Uh, hopefully the, the next video is my intent to get it to you before noon on Friday, before the actual class, or I should say our class time is 1 p.m. Um, certainly before that time frame is the goal. Um, that said, uh, that'll cover the parts of Chapter 9. Your post for this week is really more on Chapter 8 anyway. Chapter 9 would be more of the content, more going into the final week of class next week and kind of giving you just some content before you go into the final uh, area of focus for discussion board and for our our final of the of the 33 exams next week as well. This week is really just the discussion board post, finishing the draft of your paper, um, probably getting some headway on your project a little bit, although it's not due from for basically a couple weeks, right? Um, so getting some headway with that, but really focusing more on your rough draft, your paper, discussion board post, and this video, and taking a look at the other video uh, when you can find the time between now and Friday for the start of your first discussion board post, and then Sunday for your uh, paper. Uh, but that said, talking about body composition and weight management, um, uh, a uh, I was going to say a heavy topic with no pun intended toward that. That's just ridiculous how your brain tends to go somewhere sometimes. But body composition, certainly you know, it, can, it can be heavier, more body mass or less body mass. That being said, talking about body composition, more than 35% of males uh, and females in the U.S. are, at the time of the writing of the textbook, um, considered obese. Um, from a standpoint of their BMI being essentially 30 or greater, uh, body fat, typically speaking for men, even though it wasn't noted in the text, typically speaking, men above 25% body fat, um, typically referred to as being obese, whereas somewhere in the range of 35% or so, depending upon age for both male and female, is considered to be obese. Um, whereby BMI for either one is above 30 is considered to be too much. Um, nearly 70% of Americans are categorized as being overweight, above 25 BMI, uh, overweight in general. I think my BMI is around 28, 29 uh, itself, so I'm like technically obese, even though I'm far from that. Certainly far from super lean like I may have once been, but we have to be looking at these numbers as a greater picture in the context of a greater picture of what else is going on health-wise. Because one of the primary concerns, uh, as we talk about this in a, in a moment here, will be what obesity or being overweight can lead to or what else might be going on in addition to what we're seeing as opposed to by itself obesity or being overweight being an issue. By itself, if there's really nothing else going on, then there's really no reason to be concerned. It really, really isn't. The problem is, in all likelihood, on average, when someone is overweight or obese, there are other problems either currently or expected to be occurring in the next uh, few years. So it's something to be paying attention to. It's not by itself uh, the end-all be-all, although Certainly from a social, social, sociocultural uh, perspective, it is certainly one of the biggest uh, factors of significance for how we look at our lives, it would seem, uh, in the Western, in Western culture in the United States, for sure, for good, for better or for worse. Uh, lean body mass generally contains about 73.2% uh, water. Although that being said, I should say water there. That's a part that's missing. But males in general tend to be about 55 to 65% of their total mass uh, being water and women about 45 to 65%. Uh, it's a lot, there's a lot of body water, right? And that being said, what doesn't contain water is the fat, right? Uh, now, health concerns, I kind of alluded to this a moment ago, uh, are largely due to not to obesity itself, but it's links to many of the chronic health conditions that can be ensuing as a result of being uh, overweight. Of course, diabetes being a big predominant one, uh, the most common one that most people think of, a potential risk for heart disease or heart attack, um, and all sorts of chronic ailments and chronic issues with chronic inflammation that lead to potentially down the road other issues um, that inflammation can cause. Whenever it relates to the brain um, and other tissues, hormonal imbalances, a lot of things can come from uh, being overweight 
And then adding on top of that, uh, other issues can kind of be uh, an effect whereby uh, it's a building effect and things just get worse and worse and worse. By itself, it's just a factor, one factor, right? Uh, Fat-free mass is really essential when we talk about fat mass versus other mass. Well, fat-free mass or lean body mass, some people refer to it as, is all the non-fat tissue, including your bones, your muscles, your organs, and connective tissue, while fat mass is the visceral um, around the organs, um, subcutaneous below skin layer, and the essential fat. You've got to have some fat. You cannot be no fat. We'd be dead. We have to have some fat. The essential fat is at least in the in the four percent category, bare minimum. No one has ever been measured, uh, agreed upon accurately at lower than four percent body fat. And that being said, the people that were measured at four percent body fat, measured accurately, and it's agreed upon that it was done well and done accurately, are not big people. Uh, regardless of someone who has a tremendous amount of muscle mass, there's always intramuscular fat. That's why anyone who is big uh, but muscular, that's, uh, you know, six foot two and they're 250 and their uh, body fat is going to be still probably a uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, somewhere in there. And who cares? Because they're big and they perform well. And that's what matters. Not whether they're 4% versus 9%. But what usually happens is that errors in measurement because uh, some methodologies are not appropriate for measuring certain body types uh, or certain uh, athletes engaging in certain kinds of activities that can throw off some tests. Uh, that being said, Three methods for determining body composition that are both accurate and commonly used. When we say commonly in more in research areas, you're not going to find these at the gym. They're not going to be in some schools, universities, and um, research institutes and some hospitals. Um, hydrodensometry, densitometry, or often some people call it hydrostatic weighing, underwater weighing, uh, based upon the Archimedes principle of the buoyancy of water. Um, someone gets into a tub or even like a hot tub. I've done both ways. I've seen it in like a, you literally completely immerse yourself in like a hot tub sized um, uh, container uh, versus also then it where it's like a bathtub and you're not really, not, you're submerged, yes, but barely is both a, a layer of the water and like a rack that's in a bathtub. Uh, either way, it's based upon the Archimedes principle of the, bo principle of the buoyancy of water, um, the displacement of the water. Once you take a body, someone weighs someone, then put them in the water based on the displacement of the of their of the water from their body mass, we can get an estimation of someone's body fat. It can be pretty accurate. Your text notes it being about 4% or so off potentially, um, depending upon someone's particular, their ability to fully exhale, their forced expiratory volume to be uh, fully uh, enough whereby you can actually reasonably assume there's a certain amount of residual volume left. I remember one of the times I did the test, uh, I actually was not feeling well. And when I tried to breathe out, it kind of like, I felt to kind of catch up, catch a little bit. Cause you know, when you, you, it's when you forcefully exhale and you're kind of, you have a bit of a cold, you know, you want to cough and I'm underwater and, uh, and I, I couldn't fully exhale and I measured my body fat higher than I've ever measured in my life. Um, so much so that I'm 99% convinced it was far above what it, what I really am. It was measuring me at 22.3%. I've never in my life been that um, fat, body fat wise. That's neither here nor there. I just knew that it was at variance based upon my residual volume uh, or inability to fully exhale to the point where I needed to, to get an accurate measurement of body fat. And that can be up to 4% inaccurate based upon also the calibration of the equipment, the person doing the testing, because it requires a lot of uh, uh, importance uh, of care for the person who's doing the testing uh, for the person being tested. Uh, air displacement uh, plus plethysmography or just the bod pod is one of the most common ways of doing it based upon boils and then poisons uh, poisons uh, alteration of Boyle's law is the idea that uh, at a constant temperature uh, pressure has an inverse response or inverse relationship to volume and essentially when you put someone's pressure someone's weight and put them inside of a container like the bod pod they sit down in there and the displacement of air uh, when that occurs they can get a fairly measure reasonable measure um, of the density of air or the displacement of that of that air they can get someone's body fat measurement and uh, the book kind of referred to that one as being potentially more accurate potentially or less issue than and the underwater weighing, um, although in the past years, underwater weighing was considered to be the gold standard. And things change as technology changes. It's just interesting to note um, where research is coming from. Like all things, we have to be looking at our textbook and then looking at future research and looking at more and more information on a regular basis to see slight variations in the information. It's usually very rare that something is completely wrong, but certainly some variation, right, uh, in some of the research and where they get we get our research. Uh, DEXA. 
uh, dual or dual energy x-ray absorptiometry um, is basically an x-ray and basically someone's get an x-ray of your body and based upon uh, the density measurements that can determine someone's body fat reasonably well uh, and that being said it's pretty accurate um, they are fairly they're, they used to be pretty darn expensive it, it's funny how the book doesn't refer to it as being overly expensive well at least not compared to the other methods they mentioned but it's still these all three of these methods uh, are not something that's cheap to have around um, it actually requires quite a good cost, maybe not for a large institution uh, who's focused on research per se, but generally speaking, or a hospital for high, uh, high, high volume hospital with a good amount of funding, these things are, are naturally going to be part of what they have available. They're still going to have very limited numbers of them because they still are not cheap. It's not like you can walk down the street and get tested in any one of these methods. But yeah, they're all quite accurate. Um, three advanced methods, they're actually even more accurate, potentially, um, because they can actually get multiple uh, images from almost a, almost a 360 perspective, more or less, um, within reason, in more localized areas as well, some of which you've certainly heard of before. Computer tom tomography, which most people just refer to as a CT scan, uh, as well as magnet magnetic resonance imaging and uh, magnetic resonance spectro spectroscopy. Um, the MRI and the MRS are both using the same machine, um, and the CT being a different method. Uh, that being said, without going into great detail, they have a much greater ability to see more in localized areas and give us a lot more feedback for not just body fat, for a lot more going on at, at the tissue level and at the cellular level uh, to some extent or how it's affecting uh, larger masses uh, from a tissue perspective. So it's pretty impressive stuff that we can now see. And if you ever had uh, an issue whereby you were trying to get one of these tests done, it's difficult to do because they're very expensive uh, machines and it costs a lot to keep them and use them so they tend to try to only use them in situations where it's absolutely necessary which is why you may be one of those people that's never had one or may have had a challenge trying to get one done even though you'd heard it was the best way to find out what's going on with you whether it's body fat wise or something more specific tissue related um, they're, they're more expensive they're a lot more expensive and hard to uh, upkeep and find that said uh, common use methods that are done pretty much everywhere, uh, at least to some extent. They're certainly very easy to do, whether they're accurate or not, or it's a different story. Uh, the most common one in typical gym setting is typically skin fold measurement, because they can just take out little, little calipers, little plastic deals, and actually you know, measure a few localized areas on your body, and based upon the measurement of skin, um, uh, skin fold measurements, you can plug it into a formula and get a reasonable body fat measurement of uh, your body fat related to the total body mass, right? Now, skin folds can be really widely variant from like 3 to 9% off. However, you're better off doing less sites uh, from the standpoint of variation. Of the, basically, the uh, statistical variance that's going to occur from you doing 12 sites or 7 sites, if you're off by a millimeter um, for each site that you test, that you're going to be measuring someone off between 3, 4, 5 plus percent easily, which is why it's often recommended the Jackson Pollock method, which is 3 sites. Uh, the, man, the men are at a diagonal fold between the uh, nipple line, nipples and the uh, shoulder. Women are directly in the middle between the uh, elbow and the shoulder. And then the men are the vertical fold on their right side, but next to the belly button. Women are a diagonal fold at the outside of the, uh, the abdominal region there. And then both men and women are in the middle of their thigh between their knee and their hip. Okay. Uh, and that said, that's the most common way it's done. It can be variable, tremendously variable, and those tests in particular, um, and many of the tests are thrown off to some extent. There's much more, there's variance, and you, understandably, there's more variance for anyone who's a larger mass. When someone has more body size, whether we're talking muscle or fat, there's going to be higher probability of some variance uh, because there's more tissue to see through and more possibilities of uh, variation in measurement in that regard. While the certain equipment here is obviously much more accurate, there are going to still be some variance in uh, people of different sizes and body compositions, right? Um, that being said, skin fold measurements really are not accurate at all for doing something like bodybuilder measurements or for um, people who are overweight from a standpoint or tremendously overweight because it's hard to measure accurately. The assumptions made that 50% of, of the fat is subcutaneous right here, 50% of it's down below, more visceral. Um, whereas if you measure someone uh, who is striated like a bodybuilder or somebody who's just extremely lean so they don't have much fat at the skin layer, they still have intramuscular fat. So it'll give an abnormally low body fat measurement for people who are pretty lean in many situations or people who have a lot of body mass but they're uh, they're well striated or striated whereby they don't have much 
much water as their skin layer. It'll give an inaccurate measurement and give them abnormally low body fat. Whereas likewise, an overweight person, a lot of times you'll be giving someone a much higher number than they really are because there's so much more water storage there. Um, there's so much more um, fat at the skin layer. They're actually grabbing so much. You can't tell, am I grabbing skin? Am I grabbing fat? Am I grabbing water? What's going on? And you can give them an abnormally high body fat measurement. Really, we're talking about people more toward the middle, toward normal. It's quite accurate uh, for college age males in particular. Okay? But uh, it's one measurement. And like all measurements, uh, one thing has to be taken into account is when you retest, when you retest initially, you do a test, then you do a test again, and possibly even again, making sure back to back to back um, that you are accurate, uh, all in the same session, so to speak. If you're accurate, accurate in terms of the same number of response every time, that's what we want to see, whether that's the exact accurate measurement of someone's body fat. We want to see that from that number of 15.3 or 19.2 or whatever. We come back and do this again, really probably four to 12 weeks. Uh, most commonly, we're going to see changes at least a few weeks. You're not going to see a lot from a very much more frequent perspective. I know when I was a first became a personal trainer back 20 years ago, after leaving teaching and coaching and decided to be a personal trainer while I was running myself, um, I thought that I would do body fat. It was so exciting and cool. I did body fat skin full measurements several times a day for <laughs> day after day over day over day. And, of course, there wasn't much variance there, and there wouldn't be. But that was one of my reminders of, like, you're just not going to see variance. It was my way of learning that. And it was only me messing around working with just myself. If I was doing that to someone else who was in a uh, clinical setting or a uh, patient or a uh, client uh, – that would be a lot of stress on someone to be measuring them every single day, first of all, ex expectant for results, which are not going to happen, and also more overly aware of body water changes that can throw things off or differences in, uh, in storage sites from a standpoint of a uh, stressful day with more inflammation. Um, they can actually create issues. Um, some people dismiss that, but there's no question about it that can play a role. Well, how could it not? If you're bloated, how would it not? Of course, it would play a role. It obviously would. Uh, and bioimpedance uh, from a standpoint of uh, electrodes attached to fingers and toes, basically 20 contact points. Um, it can be very, very accurate in a clinical setting uh, when you're laying down. A lot of the machines that are typically used nowadays, someone's holding on to a little piece of machinery or their feet and their hands are holding on to the piece of machinery. And the, the accuracy right off the bat is going to be out the window at least a little bit, not going to be as accurate as in a clinical setting. Um, it can be reasonably accurate. If you've ever done one of these methodologies before or, or uh, used a piece of equipment, it's bioelectrical impedance, bioimpedance. Maybe you actually tried it, you stepped away, did it again, and actually was different. <laughs> if that happens, it's having difficulty measuring your body water levels. If your body water levels are variant from a standpoint of you've exercised the last couple hours, you've urinated recently, um, you've drank a lot of water or way too little water, that's throwing it off somehow. Any sort of thing, anything that throw off your water balance to any significant degree in the last in the recent couple, two, three hours can throw off this test. Um, certainly from a standpoint of uh, the uh, inaccurate measurements that are that are uh, fine for doing for someone random uh, casually just to see if there's changes if the person can be measured consistently the same that's what you have to measure someone a little more often in the beginning to make sure you're getting consistent numbers and then make it more broadly uh, weeks apart so you can actually measure change that's what we really want to see isn't it we're looking for change not just what your body fat is in this moment how will it change over time how does it affect your health your performance your well-being uh, anthropometry, basically talking about either BMI or doing circumference measurements. BMI is the most common standard probably used for some measuring someone's uh, body composition or concerns with body composition, um, saying if your BMI is above a certain point or, or whatnot, and it's referring to height and weight, right? Your relationship of height to weight. It does not take into account bone mass, bone size. Some people actually have much larger bone mass. I've always had a larger bone mass. Uh, one of the challenges for me in being a distance slash middle distance running at running uh, as an athlete was that uh, I was a bigger person for my weight from the standpoint of not height wise, but body mass wise. I was always looking broader. Um, and that was a challenge as you start moving toward higher and higher levels of performance. At lower levels, it's not a big deal. But the higher you go up, the more certain genetic variances can play a great role with something like that. I wasn't going to lose bone. I guess I could try to do that and create great health risk. And who knows what bad things might happen with that. <laughs> but try to reduce bone down, right? There are certain limitations there. Probably the most accurate for measuring someone's immediate concerns are doing waist size 
weights waist circumference and when someone's basically when their waist to hip ratio exceeds one so when the waist is as big as the hips or bigger than the hips um, and the waist generally speaking we often refer to waist in terms of uh, regular fitness type measurement health measurement is often more like belly button okay some people refer to the waist as the largest part of the waist or the hips the largest part of the hips but then it moves because as your body changes you got a different uh, different point which is not horribly wrong but probably keeping the same exact location maybe a better way to go so you have the exact same spot so you did the the belly button um, is for the waist and the hip was always one hand breath right below your belly button same exact location and if you ever have someone whose uh, waist is bigger than their hips that's significant concern obesity is definitely um, an issue certainly overweight potentially obese and health issues and concern with all the visceral with the uh, all the fat uh, in the midsection uh, is equated to a lot of chronic inflammation and chronic health issues um, is having having a lot of waste body fat in particular okay or increased waist size relative to the hips okay uh, probably the most significant factor but of course down down the road probably more important than where are the exact weight someone's body mass is probably actually measuring different body um circumference measurements the book actually has a whole table for you for where you measure like each location where you walk talking about the arm talking about the shoulders talking about the chest talking about the belly the, wa the waist the belly uh the thighs and whatnot but actually doing that with a regular on a regular basis probably one of the best things to do to measure changes in someone from a more broad perspective rather than just doing a simple body fat test even though they can be accurate some of the more accurate methods we just mentioned having more broad-based recognition of what's going on in the whole body is always a good thing and getting more measurements if you have the time and the ability to do so is a good thing there's always limitation of time uh, to be able to do and sometimes resources right to do all the testing now weight management uh, the problem with changing weight and body fat and if you maybe you will recall from your notes those of you who had me in x fizz uh, will will actually recognize some of this information it's very similar and it was pretty consistent with what the urban text was actually referring to here as well but it didn't mention this specifically I thought it's worth noting though the problem with changing weight and changing body fat is your body Research shows um, for research that's been performed for several months uh, and actually having some people measured for only two or three months for changes and then four to six months and then past six months. When people are able to maintain habits for six months and beyond, they're the ones that have the greatest likelihood of maintaining the weight loss, regardless of way they lost the weight. Now, there are probably more healthful ways to lose weight, obviously, uh, and there are more effective ways to lose weight in the short term versus long term. There's no question. But if the habit cannot be maintained for at least four, probably six plus months, realistically, six plus months. If it cannot be maintained that way, the expectation to maintain that weight loss and to maintain that lifestyle along with that weight loss and the behaviors that are going into achieving that weight loss needs to be something that can be continued for several months. And that's one of the things that uh, it's often not referred or not, not cited, not mentioned, but it's vital to understand that duration of time is crucial to recognize that we have to find something we can get this person who's concerned, we are concerned about with their weight to be doing for six months or beyond. Um, they've done studies with rats as well and actually just feeding rats, right? And then changing caloric intakes, changing activity levels. And it's only the rats that were consistent with doing whatever behavior they gave them with a low caloric diet or increased activity. They were able to maintain their behavior. And they kept them at that behavior for several months that the weight loss or the weight change maintain. Okay? That's key. Right. So we talk about weight retention or weight loss retention, whatnot. Certainly one of the greatest probabilities for people losing weight. Uh, is also the one where they're going to gain it back the fastest and we'll talk about that uh, three components to daily energy expended your book referred to some slight variations on the same terms that have been referred to elsewhere uh, but your energy balance is essentially uh, your energy intake whatever food you're totally intake uh, minus your resting metabolic rate or in this case your resting energy expenditure uh, and adding in your thermic effect of food we often refer to as thermic effect of meal tem or tef and then here we have the activity, energy expenditure, or also referred to as uh, essentially your TEA, your thermic effect of activity. Same thing. So I kind of tried to show these are the same thing. If you recall from uh, your ex-phys class, depending on what textbook you cite, they have slightly different names and different the same concepts. But essentially, your resting metabolic rate is expected to be 60 to 75 percent of your overall metabolism. Okay. So essentially, what goes into you? Your metabolic activity at rest is part of what you've been doing for the past however long. Now, we just mentioned that it's four to six months to truly make a 
significant change, guess what that change is? To truly see a significant change, we have a, no, a new resting metabolic rate where your body seems to recognize this is really you and doesn't fight to change you. It's like having your, your AC unit constantly trying to change and alter the temperature because um, it's set at a certain point. You don't change the set point uh, until someone's been going at this, all these activities for long enough, these behaviors for long enough. So we have to maintain the behaviors for at least four to six months, probably six. Okay. Um, if you want to see a big change in resting metabolic rate or your uh, resting energy expenditure, expect six months to see a big change. Okay. Is it possible to see it sooner than that? Absolutely. But it's more realistic to expect that after about six months, that's when the biggest changes we expect to be seeing. Okay. Or are the ones we expect to be seeing the most. Uh, that's and of course is more likely to be continued for long term. The thermic effect of food, the thermic effect of a meal is about 10% of the variance um, for, as far as metabolic change in you in terms of what you're eating, how it affects you digestion-wise, uh, motility-wise, uh, the food you're taking, whether it's spicy or not spicy, high calorie, low calorie, all those things can vary up to 10%. So you can clearly see your resting metabolic, metabolic rate plays a greater role than the thermic effect of food. Okay, as well, also take it playing a better, bigger role, not surprising at all, it's not mentioned enough, than the thermic effect of food is the thermic effect of activity, uh, which can be varying your daily, uh, your daily uh, uh, metabolic changes up to 15 to 30%. Now, that being the case, if it can be up to 15 to 30%, and you add that into the fact you're doing something that's changing you 15 to 30% on a daily basis for six months, guess what you're going to have within six months? probably going to have a significantly different rest of metabolic rate. And then we keep up with this activity. You can see monumental activity, monumental differences coming, which is interesting because if you're thinking about what, I, what I'm about to be talking about here in a moment here, the most common cited idea with weight management is that just exercise alone doesn't work. I'm like, you mean, are people continuing to do it? How often are they doing it? How much intensity are they doing it? Uh, are, are, what's their intensity when they're doing it? What duration are they doing it? I never like that equation because it often refers to the idea people are not doing the right activity. They're not doing it for long enough. They're not doing it frequently enough. They're not finding things they can enjoy so they can actually be likely to stick with it. Although I will always say I want someone to walk and run over anything else. Is the difference between somebody not exercising and getting on an elliptical? Then get them on an elliptical. That's fine. For the short term, next few months, make them lose some weight. Okay. Now, I don't want them to not walk at all. <laughs> we're going to lose, we're gonna lose uh, the ability to, to get the benefit from compressive forces for bone density. And you're going to have bone mineral loss from being on an elliptical all the time or a bike only. That's why I really am a mm, – I have a hard time with people getting a – right now as we're dealing with COVID, people getting a, like a, getting a bike or an elliptical. That's their thing now. I, I want you to at least have a treadmill or at least I want to know that in addition to your bike and your elliptical, you're getting out there and actually walking or jogging to some extent because it's broader than just the activity itself. What is in, what's the activity comprised of that plays a role? And that's one of the complexities that makes it difficult to really measure um, the effectiveness of exercise. If we're talking about very generalized exercise at moderate intensity, three days a week, 20, 30 minutes a day. Yeah, you're not going to get much benefit. We'll talk about that in a second. You got to do more than that. Okay. And that, that's overwhelming to some people, and that's fine. Uh, and there are people who will lose weight and keep it off from just changing their caloric intake uh, and changing their lifestyle. But the reality is if they want to actually change their metabolism, the only thing, as we can see by looking at these numbers right here, is going to, make, to dramatically change the metabolism so your metabolism is working for you is a change in activity. And the fact of the matter is the benefits – of the immediate now activity are going to probably be lasting the next day, maybe the next day or two at the most. And then that activity's benefit by itself is going to wane. Okay? We have to keep it up with more activity on top of it, on top of it, before the body has the opportunity to adjust and return toward a normal state. When we say normal state, we want to get the homeostasis. But we don't want your body to think it's normal is not activity. We want the body to think the normal is activity. Right uh, now, thermic and metabolic changes to digestion, absorption, transport, metabolism, and storage are temporary. And again, only activity creates lasting changes here. Only activity can actually increase metabolism. Nutrition supports the metabolism. Lifestyle can be make your life stressful, in which case it can be more of a metabolic increase, but also a significant cortisol increase, inflammation problems, hormonal imbalances. So that's not worth it. Um, 
low caloric deficit diets, um, unquestionably, you eat less, you're taking less in. Your body's going to get rid of mass to some extent. Of course, the biggest consumer in your body is muscle, so muscle mass is going to go first. Okay? Not fat mass, muscle mass is going to go first. And, of course, you'll lose a ton of water. Whenever you're on low caloric diets, your body loses a ton, ton of water right off the bat, 10, 15, 20, 30 pounds in the first week to month for some people. Um, so they can lose dramatic amounts of weight, but it's just because you're eating so little food. Of course, the metabolism also drops dramatically. So consequently, when someone starts to go off that diet, they gain weight dramatically back. So when they talk about um, low caloric diets, the ones that things that work the most, uh, which is really, it's often cited that way and cited that way in the book as well as being the most effective, not the most effective. It's the most continued to be followed. So consequently, um, people following that, they don't want to do the activity. So that's where we're seeing the most information from. It's the people who are engaged in regular activity. If you think about it, you're lowering your caloric de daily diet uh, every day, but you're only working out three days a week. Well, if we get you working out seven days a week, just like you eat seven days a week, can you imagine the difference in results? Someone actually exercising every day and not missing be phenomenal. That's the difference we don't talk about enough in research. We don't actually pursue enough for people is recognizing you need to be looking at this. Is this a daily part of your life? This is not something that's a part-time thing. Work is full-time, five days a week at least for most people, sometimes more than that. Eating is every day. <laughs> Sleeping is every day. Your life is every day. But exercise is only three days per week. It doesn't make any sense. It should be every single day. Maybe have a day off. Really shouldn't be options. We got to start giving people less options. Okay, that's my professional opinion on that matter. Uh, concerns with chronic overweight obesity issues. Obesity issues. Genetics definitely play a role. Um, your book referred to uh, the FTO gene. Potentially the concern there with uh, the FTO gene and how it relates to a leptin response. Uh, and we'll get to leptin here in a second. And, and of course, with more people when they uh, have this gene, uh, as they lose weight, and in general, when people lose significant amounts of weight, your body fights back. Your body's fighting back. Uh, if weight loss is higher and higher at higher levels in short periods, the body, you're, you get hungrier and hungrier and hungrier. And so then they try to find ways of making you smell something. like They have, they have uh, gimmicky things like you smell something that stinks. So when you start to get hungry, so you, you think of that stinky thing, so you won't you won't eat this. That's not going to last long term. It can work in the short term, but you got to find something that someone can stick to, right? Certainly, though, the more weight you lose, the more hungry you get. This is not surprising. You go have a really high-intensity workout, you are really hungry after that. Your body's reminding you, you just lost a lot. we got to gain that thing back. Your body assumes that what you're where you are now – is where you're supposed to be in order to trick the body into, uh, and I mean this in a good way, it's a nice trick. Your body doesn't know it's a nice trick. It thinks it's a bad trick, but it's a nice trick. To trick the body into not thinking you're doing anything dramatic is to slowly do it. That's why rather than going crazy for a couple, two days a week or doing traumatically, uh, dramatically and traumatically uh, reduced caloric diet, you reduce it a little bit over time. You do a little bit more activity over time and you keep increasing it. And it has always been my contention and everything I've ever seen for those small amounts of research that actually, that actually where people have done this, where you continue to increase progressive overload, right? Progressively getting better with your diet, progressively getting better with your exercise, progressively getting more sleep. Everything should be improving over time. You don't try to stay at the same thing on a regular basis. And it's, first of all, the body is – people don't like that. No one likes that. I'm one of the very few people who can actually eat probably brown rice, chicken, and broccoli three days, three meals out of the day, and I'd be just fine, and I wouldn't care a whole lot. Now, because of the diversity of the nutrients you need to be getting in different foods, that's probably not the most ideal. From a carb-protein-fat relationship, I could probably make that breakdown to be a pretty nice relationship there. Obviously, caloric needs, not just caloric needs, but nutrient needs are varied enough. We need more than that. But I could do that. Most people can't do that, and it creates issues for themselves, and they fall off their diets. They fall off their programming. We have to find appropriate variation uh, coming back to the same principles you see with exercise when we talk about weight loss and weight change. Uh, that said, yes, genetics absolutely play a role, and there's some people that are being much more genetically predisposed to having a difficult time losing weight, and that just simply means they need more support. What's not noted here, which is perfectly understandable, we're talking about physiology only here, but is a standpoint of when we talk about behavioral change, there needs to be behavioral support. People need to be around people, which is one of the reasons why so many of those uh, group diet things work when someone goes to Jenny Craig uh, or any uh, anything like it, Weight Watchers, things like that. And they have a support group, people to talk about problems, talk about concerns, people who need to lose a lot of weight who are obese, significantly obese, morbidly obese. Uh, they need to be getting regular help and regular support, not just on a 
changed diet. That's first of all, that's not enough. It doesn't change the metabolism, but let alone exercise and diet. They need behavioral support too. Uh, and support in uh, dealing with the fact this is not their lives anymore. It's very different than it once was. That's one of the hardest things to note, to play, to take into account, and that's what's not often noted except from world psychology perspectives, which is why we have to look at it from a psychological and a physiological perspective. There's no such thing as a highly, naturally high metabolism. It doesn't exist. Uh, if you take someone who has a high metabolism and make them sit for long periods, meaning weeks and months, they will lose their metabolism. Those of you I had in my my 406 class last semester, I'm pretty sure I mentioned my example. Uh, I always do when we talk about metabolism. Uh, I remember my sophomore year of college when I uh, hurt my knee. I uh, hurt my knee running for the uh, hot pocket in the microwave at Thanksgiving break. And I, I smashed my knee into the wall because um, I cut the corner too sharp. It was dark. I was just excited to get my microwave hot pocket. Uh, and uh, I ran my knee into the wall, and I basically didn't know at the time. It, it shook the house. My parents thought something hit the house. So like, yeah, I hit the house. And uh, my, my knee blew up the next day, uh, basically bur broke the bursa fluid sac uh, in my right knee. And basically my knee filled with fluid, of course, and I had this big bloated knee for a good couple months. So from Thanksgiving to the end of January, a little over two months, just about two months almost right on, I didn't run. I lifted weights every day. I ran a walked across campus every single day except for Christmas break. Um, but I was, you know, I was active, much more active than the average person was. I went from 172 pounds to 194 pounds. I gained 22 pounds, eating the same way, still very active, just, just losing the metabolic activity I was regularly getting. Uh, I don't think you're going to be able to tell me that uh, most people aren't most dramatically hurt by a lack of activity more than anything else as to why they're obese, why they are diabetic, not type 1, type 2, uh, a lack of activity. Okay, is the biggest impact. Nutrition is clearly important. What we eat is vital. But that being said, lack of activity is the greatest concern to raise the metabolism or to lower it. Job activity, one of the greatest problems, your book cited it, is that most people's jobs, there's just not much, much activity. Most jobs support the idea of staying at your desk and focusing on your work. We don't want you getting up and moving around. You're wasting time and you're not getting as much work done. That's a problem. That's a problem for health. It's good for the job, not good for health. Hormonal imbalances and emotional trauma play a role, um, certainly from a standpoint of lack of activity and, and poor nutrition, primarily the lack of activity that leads to this. Insulin issues, insulin resistance uh, is not just due to poor eating habits. If someone has never stopped exercising and they exercise on a daily basis, 30, 60 minutes per day, and they start eating badly, they're not going to have the same response even close from a standpoint of insulin resistance as someone who would have it, who didn't, who was not active and also in, started to inherit these poor eating behaviors. Activity, again, plays a greater role. However, with regular activity, let alone eating right foods, you can actually increase insulin sensitivity. Primarily, proper activities help with that, uh, help a proper, a proper uh, balance of hormonal response so that we don't get as hungry. And by the way, the whole idea of the ghrelin increasing with caloric deficit, with an increase in activity, just like uh, we talk about progressive overload in general, if you only gradually decrease the diet or you gradually make changes to the diet, gradually make changes to the exercise, you don't see such a dramatic response in hunger. When people talk about how hungry they are, and I've actually heard people say this. If you haven't heard it yet, you will hear it. People saying, I don't want to exercise because after I exercise, I just get hungry and then I eat, so I gain weight. So therefore, I don't want to exercise. It's a common, common thing. I can't tell you how common that is. For people who don't like to exercise anyway, they're looking for an excuse not to exercise. Um, and they don't understand yet that that's your body's first response from the fact that what you did today was a far difference from what your body normally gets each day. So don't have such a dramatic change or maintain that dramatic change every single day. And then after literally a few days, it goes away. That ghrelin response doesn't keep changing, doesn't keep adapting. It doesn't. It does it because it recognizes a significant change. When that change is now the norm, you will not have the significant change in appetite. Okay? Uh, that said, any sort of emotional trauma can play a role. I'm certainly an emotional leader. Uh, luckily, I'm active enough that otherwise I would be 400 pounds. I have no doubt I would be. I wasn't an active person because I can't eat. Okay? Uh, and emotionally stressful things. I'm not talking about like I go get a, a pint of ice cream or anything like that. But I certainly go eat. Absolutely. And I eat whatever's available. No question about it. Uh, it's just something I'll just do. But then I usually, right afterward, I go, okay, I'm going to do some push-ups. Or I'm going to go for a run. Or I'm going to do something down here on the ground right here. Do some plank or something like that. Get some activity in. Okay? It's just, just me. Most people, it's not. Right? 
emotional trauma just plays a great stress, uh, both chronic inflammation wise and lack of exercise leads to greater inflammation, greater stress and more hormonal imbalances and ultimately more weight gain. Uh, environmental habits uh, and uh, cult, such as cultural habits are significant. We don't take into account what people eat as part of their culture sometimes. Some things, some food choices that are part of normal culture is not are not good choices for maintaining healthy weights, uh, which means either uh, of basically ignore your own culture and eat differently. Good luck with that, asking someone to do that, or dramatically change the other factors you can change, which in this case would be somehow dramatically affecting uh, exercise. And that's really one of the questions that needs to be asked of anyone trying to lose weight. Uh, what are your, what's going on with your current lifestyle? What are you willing to change, able to change? Where are your controllables? Where are your non-controllables? And how much variation can we make in them? That, that's key. It's, it's more of a sum total effect. It's not just nutrition and diet. I mean, nutrition and exercise. It's more to it than that. Uh, they are the two of the greater controls, no question about it. Exercise and diet, typically speaking, there are things that we can do small things with, which is the key, first of all, small changes, not big changes. And we talked about in the past, not changing progressive overload-wise in a given week uh, or a given one session to the next or a given week to the next, for anywhere between 1% to 10% increase in intensity or decrease in rest, something that changes uh, the progression of what you're doing, right? And a standpoint that giving yourself a little bit more so you can improve from it. The same should be done with the diet. Small 1% change diet today. Not changing everything. You normally eat um, a large potato and a big piece of steak. Don't now go have a mini potato and um, a small piece of chicken. Don't dramatically change like that. How about either less steak or maybe a small change in that? We've got to make something small. For those people who have difficulty, there are people who absolutely, from a lifestyle factor change, can, will say to you, well, I'll make the change. I haven't done it yet, but I'm, I'm ready to make that change. And they will. And some won't. I've got to be prepared for that. Uh, so that lifestyle interventions in the book refers to nutri nutrition, physical activity, behavioral strategies, lifestyle interventions largely do not work. <laughs> it depends on the length of time which they're pursued and who's helping support in pursuit and what specifically is being done with the nutrition, physical activity, behavioral strategies. We really shouldn't just lump these all together like that. There is so much variance here. It's not fair to make um, – actually, to make the assumption or to make the assertion, I should say, that they don't work or not typically effective. You know, it depends on which ones you're talking about for who we're talking about and what situation. It's very situational. Uh, reduced food intake, um, again, will lower your metabolic effect. Uh, the, the very, very low caloric deficit diet, of course, you will be taking in less. You'll lose more. You'll also dramatically lower your diet, your uh, metabolic rate. And uh, the text noted research saying that uh, – there, that ultimately, over the course of a long period of time, that although the metabolism is lowered, uh, the weight gain that comes back from people who have gone on deficit diets and, and kind of crash dieted and then gone back and eat it normally, they still will lose more over a year-long period than a person on a moderate deficit diet. I'm going to argue that's going to be highly questionable where the research is coming from. Uh, the standpoint of not the research is not wrong, but is it over a, a large enough population? Are we talking about what kind of diet? What are they eating in the diet? There's a much more perspective of, of uh, there's a much greater, broader perspective we need to have with the content or we're looking at here. Okay. Now, key for you to know, leptin secreted from adipocytes, your fat cells. The more fat cells you have, the more leptin you typically have, which inhibits hunger to limit fat storage. The problem is when you have excess fat that blocks leptin from reaching the hypothalamus. So if you have too much fat, even though you think you have a little more fat, more leptin response, actually trying to tell you to not eat so much, okay? Problem is to limit ghrelin, right? The problem is that you get excess fat blocking leptin, so ghrelin keeps increasing, but leptin can't reach the hypothalamus, so you keep eating, okay? And that's what's one of the downsides of when you get past a certain point, and that's why we often talk about BMI, waist circumference, somewhere in there in that and that idea, um, we find the point where leptin ceases to be um, ben beneficial to us because there's a high fat uh, intake or high fat internally. Adiponectin is also secreted from the adipocytes and it increases insulin sensitivity, which is a good thing. Uh, it's part of fat and fatty acid oxidation in muscle. The problem is it can suppress systemic inflammation. Um, I mean, the problem, the good thing is it can suppress, suppress systemic inflammation, but as you get high fat mass, it simply decreases. So there comes a point where there's healthy fat and there's just too much fat and we don't get epinectin anymore. 
So there's some hormonal issues at play as well. Adipocytes also secrete cytokines, which signal the immune system uh, to secrete like TNFA, tumor necrosis alpha, and interleukin-6. We talked about this in the immune system a little bit. And they contribute, contribute to low-grade state of inflammation and greater potential for the chronic disease if that is gone unchecked, unchecked by having excessive number of adipocytes. Not normal uh, body fat. The higher it goes, the more potential inflammation we get, right? All right, so we have then uh, our discussion board for this week on weight loss, on trying to manage obesity, trying to determine proper strategies, hopefully giving you some ideas here. I want you to look at the text as well. I want you to be looking for deeper research as well uh, to expand upon what we talked about here or give greater depth in some areas. Uh, and then obviously you can't talk about all of it. Uh, and then your paper again is due uh, on Friday, I'm sorry, Sunday uh, on the uh, 19th, uh, preferably earlier. And I could actually send it to the person, your classmate, who I'll be emailing you so you'll know which classmate's going to be email, reviewing your paper here soon enough. Okay. And what I'll simply do is email both of you saying, uh, Skylar uh, Bailey is going to review your paper. This could be random. So I don't know whose paper is going to be, who's going to be reviewing who. And uh, I'll email you both. And so when your paper, you email back that same email when, you're, when you get your paper. And that way the person who's reviewing it will get it. You're going to have two emails, right? You're going to have my email to you and the person who's going to be reviewing your paper, and my email to you and the person whose paper you're going to review. Okay, so you're going to get two different emails. So you got to keep, there going to be two different things coming at you in that respect. Okay, the challenge of what I would normally do in a classroom, if we had our lab in class, we'd all have the papers right there and hand it to you. We do this in class. Unfortunately, we have that, that format available. And this is going to be vitally important for you helping each other to write better papers. You're not going to be graded on how much you correct, but I want you to hash the papers. Okay, because I want you to really help each other to be able to write better papers. That's kind of the intent. And I'll give you, of course, the APA format sample to be looking at so you know what you're looking at. Plus, you're going to be breaking down what makes sense to you in terms of the content and the breakdown as well. Okay, that being said, have a good rest of your week, of course. And I will talk to you again with our next video uh, by Friday at some point. And uh, we're coming to the end. Okay, I uh, hope things are going well for you. Email me. Let me know again if you need anything. Don't hesitate, okay? Take care of yourselves. We'll talk to you again soon.